Okay, duly noted. Go ahead. Uh, we should start with the first thing. Okay. Like so. All right. It is eight o'clock, so let's get started. Um, welcome to Ocular Pathology Rounds. Uh, I'm Megan Clymans. I'm one of the staff pathologists at Coplau, uh, and we'll get right into the first case. So this is a 10-year-old neutered male Labrador retriever. Uh, the case history for this case is pretty short and sweet. Um, they describe a panophthalmitis, periorbital swelling, and exophthalmus. Um, the, uh, this case in particular did not have a gross hemisected photo, so I've used a representative photo of a similar case that we received around the same time. Um, and the gross notes for our case that I will show you the histology of uh, su suggest the possibility of a limbal scleral defect um, and describe pus filling the intraocular chambers and also filling the palpebral fissure or the space behind the eyelids or between eyelids and cornea. Um, so lots of pus in and around this globe. Uh, so this representative photo also had a limbal rupture site. Uh, you can track the cornea from here to here. And here's roughly where limbus is and a little tag of very unhealthy looking thickened sclera and then nothing, just a cavernous hole that involves both sclera and uvea and is full of this pus through the defect site. So that's a limbal rupture in this representative photo. And then you can see that the inside of the eye is filled with hemorrhage and pus. Here's the outline of the iris if you need to see where iris is at and missed all this. Um, the main difference between this representative photo and our actual case is that in this photo, there was no evidence of a lens. In this case, presumably the lens had been extruded through the large limbal scleral defect. In the case that I'm going to show you, there was gross evidence of a lens. We had still had lens visible. So let's take a look at our histology and make it full screen. Ah. <laughs> So we're going to start with this little section of the globe, which captures our rupture site. I think we're just going to skip the subgross and go straight to our low magnification image. So we have our cornea facing to our right, and we have our limbal scleral defect site right here. So we have the cornea right here. We have a normal intact SMA's membrane, which ends about there. We have our melanocytes at the level of the limbus to help us distinguish where it starts. And then right at the limbal sclera, there's this defect involving both sclera and uvea, so a full thickness site of globe rupture, roughly at the level of limbus. And there's a couple of things sort of in the, the defect site that are of interest. In particular, we can see this piece of brown tissue, which is prolapsed uvea. We can see this squiggly pink tissue, which is basement membrane. We'll take a look at that in a second. Uh, but the one that I really want to drop down on is this thing right here. So let's take a closer look at that. And a closer look. So let's throw the condenser in and get it in focus. So there's this structure here. In fact, we can go even closer. Let's do that. Which is non-mammalian. And we can tell this because the walls or the cells have thick cell walls, uh, which are these sort of polyhedral, rigid looking structures. Uh, the cells themselves are probably mostly dead inside these cells, cell walls, um, but mammalian cells shouldn't have a cell wall like this. Um, and if we polarize this just for fun, well, it's a different polarizer. Oh dear. Well, wow. <laughs> okay, put it in the center and it'll be normal. All right, cool. This is a polarizer that I'm not used to. The camera is probably going to monkey with things. True, but it still looks beautiful and shiny. Yes. So we can see that the walls of this structure That's are nice. birefringent. Yeah, beautiful and shiny is what matters. All right. Uh, let's see. Let's turn the lights down. Pull that out. Ooh, fancy pull. Let's get some this out just for. Yeah. Yeah, you can sort of see a little bit more of that. Very pretty. More rigid cell wall. Yeah. Uh, and in addition, in the middle of this structure, it's colonized by tons and tons of bacteria, crusty with it. So this is a plant foreign body, and we have found this plant foreign body right at the site of a limbal rupture. Um, if we continue to look at more of what we see in this globe, 
this piece of basement membrane that we noted from low magnification. It could be a function of section, but in areas even where it looks pretty well sectioned, there's a variability in thickness of this basement membrane, plus we have an intact SMA's membrane at this level. So this is most likely a partially extruded lens capsule. And indeed, if we track a little ways into the globe, we go a little bit further back so we can get our bearings and then track into the globe. So here's our limbal rupture site. And then if we track into the globe this way, there's still some lens capsule left inside. And we have that slightly curled end of a lens capsule rupture. So we have a lens capsule rupture with partial extrusion of the lens capsule. There are more lens fibers to be had if we look around. And I'll show you that in a second. While we're sitting here inside the globe, we can zoom in on all of this pus, which is composed of variably degenerate neutrophils mixed with, or mixed with erythrocytes, so there's a little bit of hemorrhage, and with tons and tons and tons of bacteria. More bacteria, lots and lots of bacteria. There is plenty. So we have a fibrinosuppurative, uh, ultimately panophthalmitis, um, certainly most severe endophthalmitis, but all of the uh, coats of the eye are involved. Um, and it's septic with tons of bacteria uh, in the necrotic tissue inside the globe. Um, and we have a plant foreign body at a site of limbal rupture and lens capsule rupture. So all of this put together is strongly suggestive of a contaminated penetrating trauma in this case. Spontaneous lens capsule rupture is pretty unlikely. So usually when we have a lens capsule rupture, we're more uh, likely to blame trauma for that, especially in context of this case. And then because we have a contaminant penetrating trauma with a interestingly placed plant foreign body, I think there are probably two valid explanations for what that plant is doing. One possibility is that this plant may actually be the penetrating uh, contaminated foreign, uh, the contaminated penetrating trauma. Um, so this may be a plant foreign body that caused a very severe inflammation in the eye and carried bacteria into the eye. Um, it's also possible that given that there was lots of pus around the limbal rupture site and lots of pus accumulating uh, in the palpebral fissure, that this plant may just be a contaminant that's got kind of got stuck into the pus at the site. Um, so two possibilities for this case, um, but either way, contaminated penetrating trauma. Um, some pretty cute things in this section before we move from it that I wanted to show. This is just fun. If we go back here to where the choroid is, so to our left, we have the choroidal melanocytes. And to our right, amidst a sea of neutrophils in this severely inflamed eye, we have these kind of rounded polygonal cells with abundant clear cytoplasm. And these are actually canine tapetocytes. Very cute. We have a serendipitous flat mount of the tapetum uh, right here. And they're just cool to look at. Uh, if we move a little ways away from this area where the globe kind of folded funny and get brought us that flat section, we can find an area where the tapetum is more normally sectioned uh, with our multiple layers of tapetocytes over here. So this is what it looks like more normally. And then another cool little feature that we have at this level, we have some retinal pigment epithelial cells that are very hypertrophied and really hyperplastic uh, as part of our retinal detachment in this case. Um, and some of these cells have these big eosinophilic globules in their cytoplasm. And that might kind of freak you out if you're not used to seeing lots of RPE. It has freaked me out in the past. Uh, so I will say, just remember that, uh, as, as Gillian will remind you as well when you're freaking out, uh, <laughs> that um, RPE cells uh, have phagocytic and pinocytic, and they can do phagocytosis and pinocytosis. Um, they also can secrete proteins. So there are a couple of possible reasons why they might have protein in their cytoplasm. And it's no big deal. Um, they can also accumulate lipofusion, by the way, so all fun things to think about. Um, they wear a lot of hats, very important cells. And one last thing that's kind of cool in this case, well, actually, there's, more, there's lots to this case, but one last thing in the general eye slides, showing off what the rest of the lens fibers looked like, that lens capsule ruptured, and a little bit of cataract has changed at the edges, but the core of the lens was actually pretty intact and inside the eye still. And over here, our friend, the neurosensory retina, looking very put upon, detached, inflamed, and pretty extensively necrotic. Uh, so um, that is, are the, <laughs> those are the main findings in this case, a contaminant penetrating trauma, possibly due to a plant foreign body. Um, if you're thinking that that plant foreign body is a little bit wimpy, and this is ocular path rounds, and it should be more uh, robust and fun, I thought it might be uh, cool to include from our database 
a uh, slightly larger plant form and body case as I switch slides to our second thing in this case that's really cool. Here it is. Um, just a slightly larger plant form and body, you know, a more robust yeah. contaminant penetrating trauma. Mm -hmm. um, cases like this we may somewhat lovingly refer to as stick in the eye cases. Uh, mm -hmm. They do happen. Um, there, are, there are some dangers in the world. Um, so in this case, some uh, low magnification histology images, uh, unpolarized and polarized left and right, uh, with a rather large plant form body penetrating the cornea and into the eye and straight into the lens. Um, and then also I just have to include this lovely illustrative hand-drawn picture from the clinical presentation uh, by the submitters. Um, but that's not all on this case. We have one more thing. And so in this case where there was exophthalmus, we had some additional retrobulbar or orbital tissue submitted to us. So some fat and muscle from behind the eye, which is always good if there's exophthalmus or a suspicion of orbital disease. And so now we have switched to another slide, same case of the orbital muscle. And looking from low magnification, what I wanna show you as a last piece of this case are showing up one, two, three here in the orbital muscle. And if I drop in on my favorite one of those three, really close, and get into focus. So there is an unusual structure inside the sarcoplasm of this myocyte. So we have more normal myocytes around it than the abnormal myocyte in the middle. And this structure has a thick cyst wall, which is hyalinized or glassy and eosinophilic. And it's roughly from here to here or so, and from maybe here to here over here. And so the pink that's around that is the sarcoplasm of a myocyte. On this end, the sarcoplasm is becoming mineralized. So this is a somewhat put upon an unhappy myocyte. Um, I like to think of this as an overworked nanny or nurse cell. <laughs> so um, becoming a little bit mineralized, the balance of calcium has shifted. Um, and then the structure that's inside this myocyte, uh, we have a cyst wall and then inside a nematode larva, which is all coiled up and being sectioned in multiple planes along its coil. And in particular, we probably can actually go even closer and take a look. Yeah. So this is what I think is most likely a stickosome. So we've got some cells that surround the esophagus. So kind of up towards its, his cute little face here, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we have bacillary bands uh, or cells lining the uh, cuticle of this little larva, um, tightly coiled, forming a nurse cell in, uh, directly in a myocyte. Um, and just over, to go over here really quick, one last thing. Uh, this one over here is showing off a cute little curled tail right at the end. Boop. Um, so these guys are most consistent with trichinella species. Um, so this is a nematode larva that is parasitizing the muscle in this dog. Not a common finding that we see, but another, a possible type of parasitism that you can find around the eye. It's much more common for us to get submitted uh, onchocerciasis around the eye than something like this. Um, and probably an incidental finding in this case. A lot of these infections may be subclinical or asymptomatic. Um, and you can get this parasite uh, the same way people might get it. Cancer actually went in. Um, and in fact, while I talk, let's go back to the, the, my favorite one. Where are you, favorite one? There you are. Um, so you can get it from eating raw or undercooked pork. Uh, and then Gillian brought up the possibility that this, if this dog chases rats around the property, maybe and catches some live rats, that could potentially be another site uh, where this uh, pet picked up the parasite. Um, apparently in dogs, if you are seeing nematode larvae inside the myocyte sarcoplasm, you could consider alternately ancelostoma um, or migrating hookworm larvae, um, which can apparently actually get into the myocytes themselves. Um, however, because this one is coiled and forming an actual nurse cell with a cyst wall around the larva, still most consistent with trichinella. Um, the ancelosma would be less coiled and have some additional features uh, and not, wouldn't be forming the nurse cell. Um, so uh, another neat little twofer for this case. Dr. Shank here on the comments said that um, you can also get that by eating bear. Ah, bear meat. Mm -hmm. Eh, maybe this dog kind of came along on some camping trips. <laughs> a lot of species you can get it from. The sylvatic cycle. There's there's some species out in the wild carrying this. So regarding the trauma, I you mentioned it very briefly. So what, what was it again? There, there was nothing. The clinical history was very short and to the point. Just panophthalmitis, periorbital swelling, and exophthalmus. Okay. Yeah, just to highlight that that is a very common situation 
for us, we see a lot of trauma and we rarely get a history of trauma. And that should not dissuade you from making diagnosis of trauma just because there's no history of such. And it's not common also for either the clinician or the owners to come back and say, oh, trauma, no, there's no way that, that we haven't seen anything. Well, our pets do a lot of things without our knowledge, so. Like fight and eat bears, perhaps. Right, yeah. <laughs> And most intraocular foreign plant foreign bodies that we see, we think are actually migrating grass on. Sure. So yes. trauma is a little bit, depending on how you think about trauma, right. Like if it migrated up from the oral cavity, like, yes, that's technically trauma, but. Not so much a stick in the eye, maybe yeah. more of like yeah. a slow migrating penetration. And that one's kind of weird because it's like. I think it could be contaminant. Limbus and yeah, I don't know. Hence why I thought the more impressive one that was definitely a stick in the eye case <laughs> might, uh, might <Yeah>. wow. <laughs> a similar one like that was one that we actually had a history and uh, the, the owner uh, related that he was mowing the lawn and the dog was kind of behind and then mm. oh. so probably something came off the oh, lawn wow. or like projectile wow. plant material in the eye. That's why they should wear doggles. Doggles. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> cool case. All right. Uh, here are some brief diagnoses for that case. And we'll move right along because I probably already took up too much time with that one. <laughs> So this looks like an eye in like a funhouse mirror. It does. Yeah. It reminds me of uh, the <laughs> haunted mansion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. It reminds me of the stretching room in haunted mansion. Okay. Uh, anyway, <laughs> now, now that we've, uh... so let's see. We've got a three month old uh, spade female domestic short haired cat, a little kitten. Um, and they describe glaucoma, bouthalmia, and an exposure of keratitis in the eye. Um, <laughs> so this is an enlarged eye, but as we have noted, it is enlarged in a very special way. Um, so let's see if we can get anatomically oriented here, right? So we can see this lovely fundus or to, uh, to, ah, fundus, and we have a atypetal fundus here and then tapetal roughly here. So we know we're in the back of the eye. We got posterior segment here. That's good. Now, if we go from here to here, we can see that these are lovely folds or plicae. They kind of remind me of the gills of a mushroom. And so this is pars plicata of the ciliary body. It's very appropriately named. It's all folded. Um, so it's very deep. And so most of the enlargement in this globe, as it turns out, is an extremely deep posterior chamber. But there are other parts of this globe that are really stretched out as well. You can kind of make out corneal stroma coming in way down here. So maybe the area of the limbus would kind of have been here. Yep. So this globe is really distorted and stretched. And then the cornea itself is very abnormal. It's opaque, sort of white tan. And we don't have any anterior chamber that we can really make out. Instead, we have this brown iris tissue that's plastered against that abnormal cornea all along its entire length. Um, and you might be thinking that this could be lens. And if you were thinking that uh, points for thinking about things, but it's not a lens, um, it is uh, probably a combination of degenerate vitreous. And uh, we're looking down at some fibrosis along the back there. Um, as it turns out, uh, if you could hold this globe in your hands and, and turn it in the light, it would be easier to tell. Um, as it turns out, this globe did not have an appreciable lens, either grossly or histologically. And so in this case, probably extruded at some point. Pseudophagia. Uh, Pseudophagia. <laughs> pseudo Pseudophagia, pseudo yeah. <laughs> um, another thing that I'll briefly point out, which I typically wouldn't, but it makes uh, sense in this case later, I promise. If we're looking in the back of the eye, we have these little vermiform looking raised areas in the retina. And so these are little retinal wrinkles or folds. And usually I would counsel you for most cases to ignore these when you're doing the gross exam of a formal and fixed eye. Um, the eye can shrink a little, it can uh, change a little bit during formal and fixation, and you can get retinal wrinkles and it's no big deal. So don't overinterpret these in the gross exam still, but for this case in particular, I'll point them out because of reasons. Another thing that's worth pointing out is that when you cut an eye, sometimes air will be trapped underneath the retina as your blade passes through. So watch out for that artifact as well. Don't overinterpret these. I'll point them out anyway. <laughs> All right. It was a two month old, right? Three, Three months. months. Yes. Two Young. Months. Exactly. Are Three. you going to say eight? Right. Yes. Yeah. So I, <laughs> you're getting ahead of us here. <laughs> All right. You did an excellent job. 
setting the stage for your indeed own, indeed you don't want to steal your thunder <laughs> if i do miss something later though no, no, no. <laughs> uh all right we're gonna start with this slide mm. all right and i'm gonna get it on here eventually let's try for a sub gross which may or may not work out well for us. You know what? We're just going to switch directly to World Magnification Meter here. So starting over here on this side, the ocular surface in this case is indeed very abnormal. We're over here where the limbus roughly should be. We can see that the first ciliary body plica is coming out maybe about here. And so theoretically, this is where iris starts. We can also see that we have a normal corneal stroma at the edge of the ocular surface or so here. And if we zoom in closer, we can see the features of that. So corneal stroma has this lovely parallel organization to the collagen fibers in it. Uh, these are all stacked on top of one another in a parallel orientation. That's how you can tell it's corneal stroma. And you can contrast that to the more disorganized and choppy and intersecting bundles of collagen, uh, dense collagen of the sclera. So here we have the limbus right here with the scleral collagen overlapping corneal collagen. We also have an intact decimase membrane and an intact corneal endothelium behind that. So this is all normal. And this decimase membrane is pretty thin because this is a kitten. Uh, they do get thicker with H. However, this is pretty much where normal cornea begins to end as we move closer <laughs> into the middle. So maybe about right here, normal cornea is no longer. And instead, what we have is this disorganized fibrous tissue, which is directly adhered to iris tissue. And actually, if we go back right here and zoom in, we can see pretty much right where decimase membrane ends as well. So there's no decimase membrane past a certain point. Actually, hang on, it's still going. Wait for it. It's probably, oh, there actually, there's a little curly end right there. So this is where decimase membrane ends. And then no more. As we go into the center, it's broadly absent. What we can also see right here at this edge before we go too much further is that there are these tubules of epithelium that are embedded in the collagen, sort of episcleral collagen or so. Actually, there we go. Here's the other one. Um, and so these are conjunctival inclusion cysts. Um, and you can also just get conjunctival inclusions, which are just islands of epithelium that don't have a lumen to them, which we'll show you on the other side of the globe. Um, and so these are uh, little islands of epithelium that are stuck in this disorganized tissue on top of that, the character of the collagen more superficially here, it's probably better to see on the other side, but it's a little bit looser. Um, and uh, that is more consistent with a uh, conjunctival substantia propria. And let's rock it over this abnormal cornea and go over to the other side to show that off. So again, over here, a conjunctival inclusion, this epithelial inclusion here, and then on top of this abnormal cornea, we've got this disorganized fibrous tissue, we've got the iris that's fused to it, and we've got this loose substantia propria on top of that. So we have evidence of symblepheron, the conjunctiva fused to the corneal surface, and we have these little epithelial inclusions underneath that. Um, so symblepheron, complete absence and replacement of the central cornea with disorganized fibrous tissue, anterior chamber collapse with broad anterior synechia. That's what we have in this case. And you can see that the, this sort of impromptu ocular surface, which probably can no longer quite be called a cornea, um, is mostly epithelialized in section. Sometimes the epithelium is absent and sometimes it's there. And so the corneal epithelium is still doing its job and has slid across this defect trying to heal it. That's its job when there's a hole, it should slide across and try and fill that in. So there's some epithelialization of this surface. And those are the key things that we, we are seeing here. So um, the cornea perforated at some point. Uh, and in fact, because it's so broadly absent in the center, we suspect that in a lot of these cases, the cornea just overtly becomes necrotic and is gone and then filled in by essentially scar tissue. Um, the iris prolapses and then can be covered by that scar tissue. And then we get this kind of pseudo ocular surface of prolapsed iris and fibrous tissue and maybe re-epithelialized and all of this that we're seeing in this case. Couple that in this kitten with symblepheron and conjunctival inclusion cysts. And these are features that are suggestive of viral disease, viral ocular surface disease in kittens, especially herpes virus, FHV1. Not diagnostic for, but suggestive of. Um, and uh, you can get symblepheron for a variety of reasons, it's worth noting. 
Um, but you put all of this together and we suspect that early in life for this kitten, uh, a very bad presumed viral infection that led to corneal necrosis. And then this is the result, essentially sequela of a large area of corneal perforation. And we call this in uh, our cats feline early life eye disease. Now this kitten had the eye enucleated at three months of age. We have had cats that present similar to this out to like eight years of age. Um, they can actually be adults before the eye eventually gets enucleated, um, mostly because these eyes can be comfortable, um, blind but comfortable. Um, and then some, somewhere down the road, they develop uh, excessive uh, tearing or maybe a little bit of pain if the surface epithelium ulcerates or something like that and then get enucleated later in life. So also a possible presentation, despite the fact that we suspect this is a very early life change. Um, so uh, those are all interesting things in this kitten. Uh, as we said, no lens probably extruded through this large corneal perf when it happened. Um, and uh, those are the main things that I wanted to show you. But before we move on from this case, we'll switch to this slide, which shows the retina and optic nerve pretty well. So here's the optic nerve to orient you. And as we walk along this retina, there are these little folds. If we zoom in on those closer, these are actually real in vivo folds of the retina. You can see that the photoreceptor segments and the photoreceptor nuclei are elevated from the RPE. And basically the photoreceptor segments are touching one another in this fold. That and the presence of oftentimes some cells that are kind of reacting underneath. So some of these cells here are likely macrophages, maybe abnormally positioned photoreceptor nuclei in some cases. But for example, this guy is a macrophage. Um, this all suggests that these folds happened in vivo. So these are actually real retinal folds in this kitten. They can be artifact, again, be cautious to, of overinterpretation, um, but real in this kitten. And so these can be congenital um, and you can see them in younger animals. In fact, in some younger animals, retinal folds may actually go away with age and as the eye kind of grows. Um, so they may be incidental findings. And then they can also be acquired. So if you have sort of multifocal retinal detachment, for example, and then fluid underneath the retina eventually gets resorbed, you can end up with folds like this. I think either in this kitten are possible. It could be congenital folds. It could be that the large corneal perf and sudden loss of intraocular pressure led to multifocal retinal detachment or something like that. Um, so uh, just an interesting thing. We don't always see in vivo uh, true confirmed retinal folds. Um, and that's it. That's all I have to say about this case. It's probably been going on for too long. I think most of the adult cats that we get with this, um, they're not quite as bouphthalmic. Right. Yes. Oh, yes. I did have something else to say. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me. Um, so it's interesting. In this case, there was no histologic evidence of glaucoma uh, necessarily. And we did have this rather enlarged eye for a young kitten. Um, there is a reason for glaucoma in this case. Essentially, there's no pupil anymore. So how, and you know, we have broad anterior chamber collapse and anterior sneakia. So there's no path for the aqueous to take anymore in this case. So glaucoma, or at least ocular hypertension, makes sense. Um, it's possible in this kitten. So we tend to see this more often in younger animals, maybe theoretically, because the sclera is more elastic in younger animals. Um, but it's possible that the eye sort of had space to stretch in this case. And that is kind of what led to a situation where we had a large eye, but not necessarily histologic evidence of glaucoma. Um, so that's something of interest too. Uh, yeah, yeah, you can see a, a scenario where there's no, or there's a sealed corneal perforation where all the aqueous that is being produced is just accumulating there in the posterior chamber and the stretching and then just, you know, expanding to accommodate the intraocular pressure and with without putting too much stress in the back of the eye. That's, that might explain the, the severe distortion of it. And it's kind of cool. Yeah. It's a bit of a bummer. Mm -hmm. how, how do you fix this? You maintain barrier function by plugging the perf, but uh, oh, there's nowhere for aqueous to go. The yeah. They fix it with the nucleation. That's a good point. <laughs> uh, all right. The main diagnosis, feline early life eye disease, and I will shift. All right, quick switch here. Present next two cases. This the first one. Hot off. I was gonna say the cutting board, but more hot off the microscope. This is a let's see, a six-year-old um, 
Husky, May neutered. This dog is from Tucson, Arizona, and that would be important. Uh, well, it's kind of hard not to give the whole thing away right away because it is. Yeah. So, suffered a rattlesnake bite and venomation periocularly two weeks ago. Um, recovered systemically, but the eye got worse and then developed this extensive coronal edema that we're seeing here. It ulcerated and they recommended enucleation. Um, so two things, uh, kudos for the person that submitted it because we, you know, they specified the type of snake and they specifically said it was periocular because sometimes for us it's hard, if, you know, got bitten by a snake, we receive the eye, what's the relationship between, you know, the, the location of the bite, is it close enough? Mm -hmm. So we have to speculate those things. They were very, um, very simple, but had everything that we needed. So basically what we have here, you can see you got two gross images. This is the front of view, just showing the markedly edema, this uh, 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 cornea, there's vascularization um, of the cornea uh, peripherally. And then on cross section, if you follow, here's the limb. This is kind of like what we did with um, the previous case. You can see the distinction. Yeah, that'd be great. I can, I can cross it. Um, you can see the distinction between the scleral collagen here and the cornostroma. So markedly edematous, there's a larger area of edema centrally, and you see that histologically. It's pretty neat. And then you keep going, and all of a sudden, there is a defect there, right? You can see that there's an obvious <coughs> discontinuity of the cornea right at the limbus. Uh, along with that, lots of intraocular hemorrhage, beautiful looking tornado-like retinal detachment here where the retina is plastered against the posterior lens cap. So you can see the subretinal space and the choroid. So let's jump right in. We also received some of the eyelids. Uh, they're not in the picture here, but we do have um, sections of it. Let me switch here pretty quickly. All right. Okay, so it's so gross. Just a reminder, we don't get perfect uh, focus on so gross, but it does help uh, in this case. So I'm just trying, I'm going to try to do my best here. All right, so you can see right there, iris leaflets coming this way. It's a little bit harder to identify the iris leaflet on this side, and that's the penetrating side, right? If you look at it, um, there's no obvious gap right there at this point, but you can see that there's a discontinuity of the uh, normal anatomy of the corneal stroma. So it is replaced by this dense fibrous connective tissue. You can see that you know, there's a directionality to it. We try not to, um, you know, histologically give it too much in terms of like, oh, it came from here, went from there. But here you can almost see that there, you know, the, the there's a, uh, the tissue sort of pinches in here and there's fibrosis around and that kind of connects with that uh, gross uh, observable defect that we've seen. So there's a lot of connective tissue in that area replacing both the cornea and the limbus that extends a little bit into the anterior chamber. And you can see the, the iris leaflets right there, a little bit hard to recognize. There's this fibrous membrane that tracks down. And here is our beautifully detached retina plastered, plastered against the lens. Uh, and again, lots of hemorrhage everywhere. So let's take a closer look. Started with the center. You guys remember that big area of axial corneal edema that we were seeing grossly? This is what it is. It's extensive corneal edema, right? This is, of course, you know, the, the white space there. A little bit of it is artifact, but you can see how um, this is real. The, the morphology of the corneal stroma is different than the normal corneal stroma, as Megan was saying. It's very homogeneous. This is basically liquefied. This is all fluid, right? It's 
uh, it's not always that easy to diagnose coronary edema, but when it's when a coronary is just a bag of fluid, it makes it easy. You can see the difference between the deep coronal stroma, where you can still see the lamellae, versus the very homogeneous, homogeneous or very, very homogeneous e eosinophilic edematous stroma right there. Another thing that helps, if you look at the epithelium and you're in doubt, there's definitely intraepithelial edema. So, and inter and intraepithelial edema. So, that's spongiosis and vacuolization of the cytoplasm of the keratinocytes. And I think I just did something here. Okay, let's go straight to that area of defect. So, you can see. Again, go from coronal stroma to this front of proliferating vessels. So this is neovascularization of the stroma, but more than that, this is basically granulation tissue and fibrosis that has replaced that area. So the history is a two-week history of the rattlesnake accident. So that kind of makes sense. Um, it's hard to tell if that was the, the direct penetration of fangs in there, or it was just a you know, uh, the effect of the crotalid venom causing necrosis of that area. But regardless, there was a perforation um, that's been partially or healed uh, to a degree. If you look at the iris in that area, here it is, poor iris. So here's the end of the asthma's membrane. Should be the base of the iris and should have iris extending that way. But iris is markedly contracted. The ciliary body, the, sorry, the iris epithelium is necrotic. There's a lot of hemorrhage. So um, just by proximity, there was necrosis of the iris. At the same time, there's a very interesting proliferation of these reactive fusiform cells. Um, I think some of these guys are probably uh, um, iris or ciliary body epithelial cells that are not very happy with the envenomation uh, or reacting to either the necrosis or the venom itself. And they're proliferating. Uh, we, we call those fibrovascular membranes. This is very fibrous, less vascular, but it's still bleeding a lot. Um, it's one of those cases that if you just spend too much time in there looking at those cells, you might convince yourself that this is a tumor, and that's exactly what you don't want to do because we know the history. Uh, so these are all reactive cells. Um, and you can see how the hemorrhage and necrosis affected that portion of it. So this is dorsal. Uh, um, dorsal limbo region. There's hemorrhage everywhere. There's a pupillary membrane. Here's the other iris leaflet. Uh, we can see some of the same proliferative fibroblastic cells carpeting the surface of the iris. There are also what we call, for lack of a better name, caterpillars, which are these guys right here. It got nothing to do with caterpillars. It's just what they look like. We see those a lot in uh, ruptured eyes. And uh, after um, pondering what they were and deciding to do immunohistochemistry, we found out that these are probably uh, free ciliary body non pigmented epithelial cells that just migrate and are carpeting um, the surfaces. And you can see here more of them. And you can see necrosis of the iris epithelium and necrosis of the ciliary body. Now, just to wrap this up pretty quick. There's a cataract, not um, surprisingly, and there's this retina detachment. So the retina is detached, then it's also torn. The way we know it is torn is by looking at the free edges and you can see a rounded edge right there. So that suggests that it's not only detached, but there was a, a, a rupture there, a tear, and that's why it's also it's collapsed on itself. If you look at the retina, it's not doing really well either. Uh, it's markedly hemorrhagic everywhere. There are inflammatory cells. There are signs of, of more chronic hemorrhage, which fits with the timeline. So you can see hemosiderin, latent macrophages, hematoidin. So the hemorrhage has been going on for a little bit. Um, and also in a few areas, if you look around, you will see that there is straight up retinal necrosis, like here, where there's hemorrhage and lots of this eosinophilic extradation into the retinal tissue and pycnotic and cataractic cellular debris. Um, so goes along with the history. It's a perfect example of um, a case um, of um, envenomation, rattlesnake 
um, in, the, in this case, so the, the Phantom has both, if I'm not mistaken, well, it does have a uh, necrotizing effect, a proteolytic effect, but also a hemolytic effect and increases vascular permeability. So what we're seeing here is just the effects of the, of the Phantom itself in the ocular tissue and uh, interestingly, a little bit more chronic than what we usually end up seeing um, two weeks after the fact. Um, quickly, we got some of the eyelid of the periocular tissue around and the eye and the dorsal eyelids. Uh, there were signs of kind of a similar um, phenomenon. So here you got the eyelid margin, you got maybe the mebomian glands over there, eyelid margin, there's skin on one side and conjunctive on the other side, just so we know where we are. So you got uh, other similar sections right there. And here a little bit deeper, probably closer to the sclera. You can see that there's marked fibrosis of the deep connective tissue. There is some degeneration, regeneration and fibrosis around um, striated muscle fibers. You can see them kind of existing on their own, they're surrounded by the fibrosis. And in some areas, you even see more active degenerative changes in the muscles. So everything fits with the clinical uh, um, diagnosis and the clinical description. So rattles naked animation, scleral uveal retinal hemorrhage, necrosis, fibrosis, intraocular hemorrhage, retinal detachment and tear, and all sorts of other good things that I didn't put there just uh, because of space. Did they say what kind of rattlesnake? Was that? Did they say what kind of rattlesnake? They didn't. Uh, I was happy that they actually said rattlesnake yeah. <laughs> rather than just looks like it was a snake or it might have been a snake, um, but they didn't. Yeah. Different features have different combinations of proteases. Right, yeah. That's why I went with like the overall uh, effects of a uh, generic crotalid venom, let's put it that way, <laughs> uh, kind of both together. Yeah, but that's an excellent point. And uh, clinicians out there, if you know that, sometimes uh, it's not your fault, sometimes you, you don't know that information. But if you do, feel free to let us know. Okay, next one. Pretty quick, so Gillian has some time. This is a uh, a let's see three years six month old gray dane may neutered we have received the left eye so clinical history here it states that i think there is another one uh, again very uh direct they say retinal detachment uh they are suspecting a uh, persistent hyperplastic primary vitreous slash persistent tunica vasculosa lentis. Put this all together. Persistent fetal vasculature. Easy, easier way to put this. Uh, and they suspect some hemosiderating on the lens. They said no glaucoma. And that was basically it. And some, you know, posterior polar cataract, as we can see. Now, the interesting uh, observation is that the contralateral eye also has similar lesions. So, uh, this turned out to be bilateral. So basically what we're seeing here is relatively okay, I don't know, anterior segment wise, but then you have the lens and there's this little nubbin here at the posterior pole of the lens. Uh, we have retinal detachment. The optic nerve is somewhere around there, right? We have to confirm that the retinal detachment is real, but it looked real when we cut in, the vitreous was relatively liquefied. Uh, so we're gonna focus our assessment on the posterior segment of this globe. All right. So here it is. Beautiful looking retinal detachment and tear. In this case, you can see, well, you can't see. You could, right? If you turn your imaginoscope, some rounded edges of the end of the retina. We will look at it closer. Um, so again, if you just draw a line and the anterior segment, everything looks pretty okay until you get to the lens. And then you can see that pale white nubbin that we've seen grossly right there. There are, it's very, it's hyper basophilic there, which suggests mineralization or something similar. 
Uh, here's the optic nerve and the detached and torn retina. Some liquid features. We're going to take a look at some of those membranes there too. Okay. So there are a few things. So there's doubling of the SMS membrane. There are a few things happening in the interior segment, but they are not necessarily that important in this case. So let's focus on the lens itself. So there is... Um, so the lens is a little, you can say flat and sort of bean shaped. Uh, this is uh, something that might be hard to assess normally. Um, fixation can change the shape of the lens. Younger uh, animals, they tend to have a more flat looking lens to begin with. But in this case, we know that there are you know, real changes associated with it. So we might assume that those are real. If you get to the equator here. It's a beautiful looking lens until it's not. So it's a got the anterior lens capsule, the lens epithelium coming around, going into the bowl perfectly, doing what they're supposed to do. On the other side, similar thing, maybe goes a little bit further, but not that bad. But then you look around, the nucleus looks a little um, abnormal, but nothing really that impressive until you get to the posterior pole of the lens. And there we have two cool things right away. So the lens capsule sort of splits open. So there's one little fragment that comes this way and there's another squiggly one that spreads open and blends with that tissue that we were seeing. You can see that the lens capsule sort of continues there uh, and it gets very thin, it disappears, but we have that similar splitting on the other, on the other side of that area and then we got this very thick fibrous connective tissue lots of vessels in there there's hemosiderin laden macrophages in red blood cells like they described clinically which i thought it was a kind of a cool thing they said hemosiderosis of the lens I'm like oh my you know what they're talking about and then we have this which is um so you see the pattern of the collagen starting to change and then it becomes mineralized so this is osseous metaplasia um, if you decalcify it, you will probably see some osteoid in the background with some osteocytes um, in that area. Um, so this whole arrangement is consistent with a persistent fetal vasculature. Sometimes you don't see just the vessels themselves there. You have uh, this plastic or metaplastic tissue associated with that area. It makes sense. The lens it, um, embryologically closes at the posterior pole. So it is a congenital effect, but there's a failure in closure of that area. And either the, the, the fissure in failure in closure uh, um, was prompted by the, persi the persistency of the vessels, or it's both kind of a combined thing. The, the vessels persisted because it never closed, but it's, uh, it's not uncommon to have uh, metaplastic tissue like that. Sometimes you've seen uh, things that look like uh, neuroepithelium, fat, and other types of, uh, of tissue. In this case, we have some osseous metaplasia. Moving into the retina itself. So there's a, that retina detachment. Those are the round edges I've talked to you about. There's a cool thing that happens with chronically detached retina. It's basically edema of the outer nuclear layer. We call it retinoschisis. You can see these big vacuoles in the uh, 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 in the outer layers of the retina, uh, it can be either, either in the inner or outer nuclear layer. Uh, markedly, um, the story of retina, but you can still see ganglion cells in there. So that fits with the history, um, fits nicely with the description, with the clinical description, so a pers persistent fetal vasculature. There are these floating epithelial bits here. They are weird. Uh, I think these are probably fragments of the epithelium or the uh, peripheral retina and the epithelium ediara serrata that kind of came together. Sorry, Gideon. So the mouse is kind of weird. We're not hangover or anything. It's just that it's not, the arrow is not really following instructions. So persistent fetal vasculature, big retina attachment with uh, a similar lesion on the other eye, um, 
they don't necessarily present as bilateral disease, but of course uh, they can because we've just seen one. Uh, but you don't you shouldn't assume that this would be bilateral just because you diagnose it in one eye. All right, switching over to Dr. Sean. All righty. So this is a case of a 14-year-old corgi. The history we received was pseudophagic in 2020, which means they did cataract surgery in the year of 2020. And pseudophagic means they implanted an intraocular lens, which is a fake lens to allow the dog to hopefully be able to focus as they did before. So that's actually what we're seeing right here. Uh, and then hyphema and secondary glaucoma was diagnosed in February of 2024, so about four years later. Also diagnosed with systemic hypertension. Uh, they say focal irritable hyperpigmentation, chorioretinal scars, borderline keratoconjunctivitis of the left eye, which is this one. So yes, glaucoma, highest documented pressure was 21. The other eye, they say punctate cataract, so has not had cataract surgery, irritable hyperpigmentation, chorioretinal scars, and borderline KCS as well. The dog has, as I said, systemic hypertension and vestibular syndrome. So here is the eye, and this is an interesting sort of fun twofer of an eye. Cornea is always at the top. It is a little bit cloudy, so there's probably some corneal edema. The anterior chamber has these strings going across it, um, some sort of dense off-white strings and some hemorrhage. These are going to correlate to membranes. Here is the IOL, uh, and it seems to be in the proper position, so I think it is behind the iris, so it is in place. Uh, presumably the lens capsule is around it. We just, it's hard to actually identify in this gross photo. Obviously there's also a lot of hemorrhage in the posterior chamber here, in the vitreal space and probably in the subretinal space. This is the detached retina. Uh, the elephant in the room mm -hmm. is this white mass that is in the ciliary body on this side of the eye. And this is the detached retina, but it's a little bit extra. So there's some extra stuff going on there. It's a little bit too much and too dense to be just straight, normal, I mean, retina. So there's probably some fibrotic tissue associated with that detached retina. The optic nerve is somewhere in this region and it, we can't see it in this image. So those are the gross findings. Um, real quick, whenever you're doing any kind of exam on an eye that has had cataract surgery, you should pay attention to when the surgery was done and if it was recent in the last month and something went wrong in that period of time, which is probably why it's in your jar on your counter, um, you should really pay attention to the surgical incision um, and the surgical site, which is usually dorsal somewhere, uh, because uh, if there's dehiscence of the surgical incision, that can lead to uh, bacterial endophthalmitis. Uh, this one was four years ago, so we're a little bit less concerned about that. All right. Oops. Okay. All right, so here's our mass. The lens capsule cavity here uh, has the IOL. You can see it has a little squared off area right here. And that's where the end of the IOL was. Uh, sorry, IOL stands for intraocular lens. That's what they call the fake lenses. I'm not sure why they call them that, but whatever. Um, so they call it uh, intra. Yeah, I'm sorry, lens extraction when it takes yeah. the <laughs> Right, yeah. Differentiate from an extra awkward lens, like so. <laughs> <laughs> Megan is pointing to her eyeglasses and calling those her extra ocular lenses. Well, I guess that's true. Yeah. Okay, uh, so there are all these pink membranes around. There's hemorrhage all over the place. The retina is detached. We didn't actually sample that sort of sheet of tissue that we saw in the gross photo. Here's our optic nerve head. Um, and then here's our extra slice, which with more of those membranes. So. We're going to spend a little bit more time on the mass because this is probably what led to the problems for this eye. 
other than the fact that it had a cataract and cataract surgery. So the mass is within and expanding the ciliary body, and it is also extending into the limbal sclera here. From this mag, it's hard to make out what sort of patterns these cells are doing. So let's go higher mag. Um, from slightly higher mag, these neoplastic cells, maybe you can convince yourself they're forming small lobules and trabeculae. They are polygonal with variably distinct cell borders, maybe some vacuolated cytoplasm, Mm, round to oval nuclei, finely clumped chromatin, and fairly prominent uh, magenta nucleoli, single, for the most part, magenta nucleoli. I don't remember what the mitotic rate was here. Let's see here. I said there were 14 mitotic figures in 10 fields with the millimeters squared included for specificity's sake. Um, so... Uh, a mass in this region, and it's actually also infiltrating and expanding the iris, a mass in this region that's affecting the uveal stroma with this growth pattern and those cellular features is most, it, this is consistent with an iridociliary epithelial tumor. This one happens to be uveo invasive. They aren't always quite as stromal invasive as this one is. And the fact that it extends into the limbal sclera would bump it up into the category of a carcinoma. Now, uh, having said that, and ultimately my top differential for this one is a primary intraocular neoplasm, I cannot rule out the possibility of a metastatic carcinoma to the eye. In order to really sort of try to figure that out would require some immunohistochemistry. However, a lot of that is can ultimately be quite ambiguous. And so I usually, uh, encourage people to stage the patient to look for metastatic disease that um, if present might indicate that this truly was a metastatic neoplasm from elsewhere in the body that arrived in the eye uh, as opposed to um, well and so iridociliary tumors that are primary ocular tumors tend to not metastasize they're quite benign so sur complete surgical removal is uh, curative so I would assume that if this dog had masses elsewhere they were probably some other type of neoplasm if this was an iridociliary tumor. Anyway, um, so I did a PAS stain to look for basement membranes. There are some delicate basement membranes around some of these neoplastic cells. Iridociliary tumors like to form very thick basement membranes around, some of them like to form thick basement membranes around uh, clumps of uh, neoplastic cells. Um, the basement membranes in this one weren't super convincing, but the rest of what's going on in this eye is a lot of hemorrhage, a lot of very dense fibrovascular membrane formation. You can tell this is chronic hemorrhage because here we have hematoidin and hemosiderin laden macrophages, this yellow and the brown. When we um, look back, the retina is detached it's quite atrophied, so it's probably been detached for quite a while. And then when we move back into the choroid, oh gosh, focusing. Remember, this patient has systemic hypertension, so we always kind of want to look at blood vessels to see if we can corroborate that. And in this case, we could. So here's a blood vessel. I'm not quite sure where its lumen is anymore. The wall is quite thick and disorganized. There are some foamy cells in the wall. It's a little bit hard to tell maybe whether that's lipid in their tummies or just fluid, um, but this could be an atherosclerotic uh, vessel. And I think there are a few more. All right, I can't remember where they were. At any rate, so there is some sort of vascular disease going on here, and I know we're close to the end of time. So I think I covered the most important things here. Let's go see what I have to say. Okay, so status post-operative cataract surgery with IOL pseudophagia in 2020, intraocular carcinoma, clean margins. Uh, my top differential was an iridociliary carcinoma, which is the second most common primary intraocular tumor in dogs, second to melanocytic tumors, uh, versus a metastatic carcinoma, which I really think is less likely. Um, 
And then the vasculopathy. So whether this is simply hypertensive vasculopathy and or atherosclerosis um, is up for debate, perhaps. I was pretty convinced those were lipid-laden MAC figures. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they didn't mention anything in the history about um, hyperlipidemia, but it is a 14-year-old dog. So yeah, he yeah. Isn't um, no, not that they told us. So, and the vascular disease might explain the dog's vestibular syndrome as well if it was wreaking havoc uh, in the vestibular system in the brain. So that's it for right now. Um, so kind of a complicated case. I did suggest um, immunohistochemistry. I suggested cytokeratin and bimentin, but I did specifically say that ultimately the results are always going to be slightly ambiguous and that uh, staging the patient would probably be a good idea. That's all I got. So there we go. Thanks for your attendance. That's all we have for today. Yep.